everybody at Boonville First United Pentecostal Church. I am Pastor Jonathan Soton, and I want to thank you for tuning in and joining us tonight. And we're going to be concluding our Bible study concerning the fruit of the Spirit. And I look forward to seeing each of you this weekend, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Before we get started tonight, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer and ask that he would help us and uh, ask that he would minister through the Bible study tonight. Uh, we do have some prayer requests uh, that we want to share with you. And uh, I know there's been several unspoken requests this week, but also uh, I'd like to ask that we pray for Sister Shirley Isbell. Uh, she had a fall this afternoon and she's back home and she's fine. And we rejoice that nothing was broken, uh, but we wanna pray that God would give her strength in her body and help her have a good, speedy recovery. Amen. And so I just want us to go to the Lord in prayer as we get started. And once again, thank you for joining us. If you would like to go ahead and like and share uh, this feed, uh, that would help us spread the gospel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare for our Bible study tonight. God, I love you so much. And I thank you, Lord, for those that are watching, uh, those that are hungry for more of you hungry for your word. God, I pray, Lord, that you would let it speak to us tonight. Help us, Lord, to lean on you, to lean on your promises. God, to lean not on our own understanding, but help us to acknowledge you and to trust you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch these requests, Lord, that we've had this week. I pray, Lord, that you would minister in every family, in every home. God, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to touch our elected officials, Lord, those that are in leadership here locally, Lord, and abroad. I pray, God, that you would continue to give them wisdom as they move forward. God, I pray you would continue to keep your hand on our health care workers. God, those that are, uh, are close to this, I pray, Lord, that you would help them be protected and protect their families in Jesus' name. God, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to touch this Bible study. God, I pray, Lord, that you would let it Take root downward, Lord, that we can bear fruit upward, and we'll be careful to give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we get started tonight with our Bible study, I also have just an exciting announcement. Uh, we are going to be getting uh, phase one of coming back into the sanctuary this Sunday, May the 17th. And uh, I am so excited. Many of you have expressed that you are ready to be back in the sanctuary. I know that I am. Uh, we are going to have some different guidelines in place to help keep everyone protected that we return safely during phase one at nine o'clock a.m. Sunday morning. Uh, we invite any of our seniors or those that are compromised in their immune system to come. If you're at increased risk or if you don't want to be around a larger crowd, uh, come. We are still going to be asking that families sit together of the same household and that there be space provided between each family. And then at 11 o'clock a.m., we're inviting everyone. So at nine o'clock a.m. for our seniors or those that are increased risk, and then at 11 o'clock, we're inviting everyone to come. And so I hope that you can come. And again, if you don't feel comfortable getting out yet, there is no pressure at all from us, uh, but we wanna go ahead and provide that opportunity for those that do wanna come. You can still join us instead of 10 o'clock for our live stream. Uh, we're going to be, uh, because of our internet situations here at the church and what we ran into last week, to provide you with a better viewing experience, uh, we're going to be bringing our 11 o'clock service online at 6 o'clock p.m. And so just want to give you a heads up. If you're in the sanctuary with us for our 9 a.m. or 11 o'clock service, uh, we're going to be live streaming that 11 o'clock service at 6 p.m. We'll be broadcasting that. So uh, we don't want to give you a bad experience as you're trying to worship with us. And so I want to make sure that we do all that we can to give you the best experience possible as you view our services. Again, thank you for tuning in tonight for midweek. And we're going to jump right back into our Bible study. We are on lesson three, our final lesson concerning the fruit of the Spirit. And I may repeat some things at the beginning tonight that we have repeated the last couple of weeks, uh, but that is just to make sure that we are on the same page as we get into the remainder of our lesson tonight. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me, Genesis chapter number 5 and verse number 22, 
It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then after he named those, he said, Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. And we, we talked the last couple of weeks about after we have decided to follow Jesus Christ, after we have decided to make Him Lord of our life, that we have submitted ourselves to serve Him as Lord of our life, then we expect our life to begin to change. And we are no longer letting the works of the flesh be manifest and produced in our life, but now we are bearing or we are producing the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. He said, do men gather grapes or thorns or figs of thistles? And then he begins to talk to us about how every good tree brings forth good fruit and every evil tree or corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. And he tells us that a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. And an evil tree or a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. And so we, we are going to be known by the fruit that we bear, that we produce. And so as Jesus begins to tell the and the minister about how we're going to be known, we're not going to be known by how powerful we are or how much privilege that, that we produce or that we show or how big or how small our churches are, but rather he insisted that we're going to be identified by one thing and that is by the fruit that we bear. And so I don't know about you, but I want the fruit of the Spirit manifested in my life. I don't want the works of the flesh manifested. I want the fruit of the Spirit to dominate. And we talked about the importance of, in order for that to happen, we must allow our walk with God and our trust in God and our faith in God to continue to be rooted downward so that we may bear and produce more fruit upward and so if we will get rooted you will produce fruit if you say pastor i'm just having a rough time uh producing and and bearing this fruit of the spirit well i just want to encourage you just be more intentional in getting grounded and rooted in who god wants you to be and so we named the the nine substances of the fruit of the spirit we talked about love joy peace and long suffering last week and we're going to begin talking about the rest of that uh, this week beginning with gentleness and so if you would just repeat that with me everybody say gentleness um, gentleness comes from the greek word that means moral goodness or integrity or kindness uh, the King James Version says gentleness, but the word in the Greek is actually Christos, C-H-R-E-S-T-O-S, which also means goodness in actions. It means sweetness of disposition. It means gentleness in dealing with others or benevolence or kindness uh, or affability or the ability to act for the welfare of those that are really working against your patience. And so notice the word Christos we just mentioned. C-R-E-S-T-O-S. -E That's just one letter difference from the word Christos or C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S, -S, which is the Greek word for Christ. And so whenever the first church began well over 2,000 years ago, uh, it was often confused with Christos, or the, the word Christos was often confused with Christos. And they, even though they thought that Christians were just people that believed in kindness. Uh, they thought Christians were people that were just kind people. They called Christianity actually the kind religion. Uh, I don't suppose that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, because the Bible does teach us that Jesus Christ actually showed us and demonstrated the ultimate act of kindness uh, whenever he took on the form 
of a servant took on the form of a human, let his body take on flesh. Uh, he came to the earth to die for our sins so they could be forgiven. And I would say that is the ultimate act of kindness. Amen. And so Titus chapter three and verse number three, he tells us, for we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared. Listen to this. He said, after that loving kindness toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And if we want to know what kindness is, all we have to do is just take a good look at Jesus Christ. Amen. He is an example of what kindness really is. He is the kindness of God. And he told us to do to others like he has done to us. And uh, here's what we've got to understand is that God never asked us to do anything for anybody that he hasn't and hasn't already done or he hasn't been willing to do himself. John 13 and 15. For I have given you an example. He has set us an example that we should do as he's done to us. And so we can be kind and we can be gentle, listen to this, without being judgmental. Can I get an amen? And uh, so yeah, I, I might just say that again tonight. We can be kind by being gentle and not by being judgmental. And so when people are having a, a tough time dealing with issues, when they're having problems, uh, whenever they're being overcome by things in life or situations or they're being tempted, uh, it is important that we are gentle with them. And this is uh, just something that I've learned in, in leading and, and in pastoring. Uh, we've got to remember, even uh, especially when people are hurt or whenever they are uh, either by life or by circumstance in their, in their situations, uh, they can be ultra sensitive. And so even whenever you are doing your best to exhibit kindness to them, uh, it can be perceived as something that you are against them. And so this makes this part of the fruit of the spirit, this gentleness, even that much more important as we deal with people, uh, whether they be people that you are teaching and loving, or if it's just a coworker or someone at the grocery store, uh, that's the reason why we've got to be careful uh, for those people that we encounter in public. I don't know why I'm getting on this, but maybe they help somebody that they're having a rough day and maybe they hit you with their grocery cart and it was an accident. And if you do anything other than say, I'm sorry, excuse me, then they may just all of a sudden have a breakdown and just go off. Uh, I, that's important for the Christian that we be gentle with people because we never know what they're going through and understand that they are ultra sensitive if they've been hurt or if they are in a season of pain. And so gentleness is an important part of the fruit of the spirit. Another part, we're going to move on to goodness. Goodness. Uh, that word means uprightness in heart and life. Not just in my heart, but in my life. Uh, I need to live uprightly. That's how I bear that part of the fruit of the Spirit. And it should be in the heart of every Spirit-filled person, every Spirit-filled person, to do good to people that are in need if we are able to do good to them. And so we must remember that, regardless of if they can repay us, uh, if they're going to appreciate it or not, it's regardless of if they fulfill their responsibility of being thankful and grateful, we are still to do what we can to help our fellow man. And somebody say amen. Romans chapter 15 and verse 14. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. And listen to this last part of this verse. Able also. Paul is telling the church in Rome, I am persuaded that you are able to admonish one another. 
There should never be anything in our life where we can't admonish one another. And so don't let the works of the flesh separate you from letting fruit of the Spirit be produced in your life. And the Bible teaches that people are not born good. Uh, we are born in sin or shaping in iniquity. The Bible says in Psalms 51 and verse 5, he said, In sin did my mother conceive me. We are born with a sinful nature. And even without a bad childhood or harmful experiences or something happening to you as you grew up, we are just naturally inclined toward rebellion and disobedience and selfishness. That's why we must bring our flesh into subjection to the spirit. So we, he said, that's why if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. If we are following after the spirit, if we are living in the spirit, if we're walking in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust or the works of the flesh. And so the Bible teaches us that regardless of all the personal things that we've experienced in life, all of us ultimately choose our own behavior. I can't choose your behavior for you, just like you can't choose my behavior for me. Uh, and so, but we also must understand as we make those choices, and I've been preaching about this on Sunday, Sundays, uh, about how choices have consequences, whether they be blessings or curses. The choices that we make, every choice we make, the Bible says he sets before us every day a blessing and a curse. And we choose between the blessing and the curse that's set before us each day. He said, you'll receive the blessing if you obey my commandments, or you'll receive the curse if you rebel and disobey my commandments. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, Paul again talking to the church in Rome. He said, don't you realize that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master? Think about that. Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. You can choose sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God and receive his approval. And uh, now I just told us that we have um, the ability to choose. It's our choice. But I also understand as someone that's, done my best to live for God, uh, I also understand that in myself, there are times where in my flesh, I can't make the right choice and I can't make the right decisions. There's not power in me to choose right behavior sometimes even if I want to. That is why I'm standing before you thankful tonight that I have the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God living inside of me. For when I am weak, the Bible says that he is strong. And so whenever I am weak, I got to let his spirit, he tells me again, we've read it already, that if we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. If we're walking in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so I refute that excuse that sometimes is given that I just, you know, I, I can't live a perfect life. I'm not saying that any of us are perfect but we don't need to just give the devil room in our life by using the excuse, well, if I fall, I'll just get back up again. Although he does say that he will give us strength to get back up, or he says, don't rejoice against me, my enemy, when I fall, I will arise. But we can't just always quote that scripture. Sometimes we need to be quoting, with every temptation, God has given us a way of escape. And because of the way of escape God has given me, instead of me testifying, I've fallen, but I've gotten back up. I need to also have a testimony. I was tempted, but I found a way of escape. We've got to understand that we don't have to sin in this present world. He said you can choose sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God and receive his approval. I come against the lie of the devil that says you have to sin or you have to have bad things happen in your life in order for the will of God to come to pass. I come against that. 
Amen. Now, God can turn bad things into good, and I'm a testimony tonight that God can take mistakes and sin in your life and forgive you and use those things that you chose and, and to mess up some parts of your life, and God can use that to become a testimony that would help increase his kingdom, but you don't have to make those bad choices and sin in order for God to use you in a special way, and you don't have to be caught up in a sinful lifestyle to have a testimony to be delivered out of. You can testify. I found a way of escape with every temptation that God has. He's provided me a way of escape with every temptation that's ever come my way. And I have found and taken advantage of that way of escape. Just feel to tell somebody that tonight. Be sensitive to God and know that, that you have, a, if, you, if you have refrained and you've never been addicted to drugs or alcohol, you need to thank God and say, I found a way of escape. And I, I again, I believe that God can deliver anybody from anything. But understand, you still have a testimony if you haven't fallen off into some of those things this world has to offer. And so let, let that fruit of the Spirit, amen, be produced in your life. But we've got to understand, sometimes it's not the power in us that chooses things, but with the Spirit of God only can we make the right choices. That's why it's ever more important that we are filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. I, I, I just feel that in my spirit. If you don't have the Spirit of God living inside of you, you can receive the Spirit of God right now. Amen. Just ask God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Repent of those sins. Ask God to, to fill that emptiness after you let that old man die. Amen. Let him put new life in you tonight. Romans chapter number 7, verse number 18. I know I am rotten through and through. This is a New Living Translation. So far as my old sinful nature is concerned, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. Again, sometimes we need the Spirit of God to help us when we're following at the Spirit of God. Then it's no longer something that I'm relying in my flesh, but as I'm walking in the Spirit, the Spirit of God, when I am weak, He is strong. It takes God in us for there to be good. Any good thing in me is only of God. There's nothing good in me except God. We don't, that's the reason why we can stand on the word and say, well, you know, we don't get good to get God, but we get God to get good. The only way any goodness is coming out of us is if God is in us and God's coming out of us. The only, I say again, the only solution to our sin problem is the power of the Holy Ghost. The only solution to the problems with what's going on because of all this season of separation and the increase in addiction. And, and I know on Monday nights we are missing all those that are part of our life recovery program. And we are looking forward to starting that back up in June. And we'll be announcing that to you because we, we don't want you to have to fall off and feel like you don't have any support. We want to know that this church is here for you. Amen. The only solution, though, is the power of the Holy Ghost living inside of us. If we're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit, it only comes from the Spirit. And so, <coughs> excuse me. Our most accurate modern word in today's culture for goodness would be the word wholeness or, in other words, integrity. Integrity is very important to God. However, it is also very important to you and I. It's important to our relationships with people. Integrity. Uh, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that our public image much must match our private reality. Who we are when nobody else is around. How we feel about our brother when nobody else is around. How we feel about our fellow man. How we feel about each other. If we don't have integrity, we are not good. I'm going to say that again. If we don't have integrity, we are not good. Um, let's look at it like this. Um, words are not contagious. Uh, words can be repeated. But the Bible says out of the heart, the abundance of the heart, 
the mouth speaks. Um, now, some things can be said from our minds. Uh, we can we can say let's just uh, say it like this I can I can read four times twenty five equals a hundred because I know what the X means and I know what the equal sign means and I know how to read numbers so four times twenty five equals a hundred I can say that because I can see it I just say it uh, but if I know how to read Although I can say that, if I don't know my multiplication tables, then I don't know the foundation of what I just said. Uh, so either, even though I can say something that is true, if it's something that's not understood, then it doesn't have the same meaning. And so we can say God is good. We can read God is good. We can say God is our Savior. We can read God is our Savior. But if we don't understand that, then we need to seek to understand what it is that we are reading and what it is that we are saying. We can say God is faithful. But there's a difference in saying God is faithful and understanding God is faithful. And so sometimes understanding is given through things that happen in our life and through study and through conflict sometimes. Sometimes understanding is given through means that we don't like. Right now, um, I'll be the first to tell you, you know, we're, we're, we're doing homeschooling like every other parent. We're just finishing up this week. Um, the schools or the last assignments have been given. And I, I give props to every teacher, every teacher's assistant, every principal, uh, keep up, keep in prayer our Prentice County School District uh, right now. Amen. That God would touch touch them, special need there. Amen. But I I just I give props to our teachers because I am learning just as many of you are that it's tough teaching Noah. Reading and writing and sounding it out. And they say, you know, they act different at school. I hope they do. Praise God. Amen. Because it, it's tough. Uh, but, but there is a difference in just saying something and understanding something. When we have an understanding of something, we can better relate what it is that we are saying. And so, again, our words are not contagious. What we claim to be and what we type on social media, what we post on social media, that's not contagious. Somebody can like it and share it, amen, but that's not contagious. Your lifestyle that you live, though, is contagious. Your, the way that you are showing commitment, the way that you are showing your, your ability to, to love and to lead, and that, that's, that's what matters. Not what we say, but what we do. And that's the reason why sometimes people that are closest to us Sometimes don't want to be around us. Uh, let's just say it like it is. Uh, and so I'll, I'll move on. Paul gives us two practical principles for being good. Romans chapter 12, verse number nine. He says, be sincere in your love for others. He tells us, hate everything that is evil and hold tight to everything that is good. Romans 12 and 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What is he saying? He's saying hold tight to your integrity. Overcome evil with integrity. Uh, time will reveal all things. Time will reveal motives. Time will reveal all that. That's why individually we must just be determined. I'm going to maintain my integrity and let time reveal all the rest of it. And so let's, let's make sure that we're holding on and overcoming evil with our integrity. Uh, the only way we can beat the devil is by living the same in private as we do in public. Let the Holy Ghost begin to grow that goodness in our life. Amen. So we've talked about love. We've talked about joy. We've talked about peace. We've talked about long-suffering. We've talked about gentleness. We've talked about goodness. And now I want us to take just a few moments and talk about faith. 
faith. That word means faithfulness. Faith, that word also means one who can be relied on or moral conviction. Faithfulness is important to all of our well-being because we were made, we were designed to operate in the principle of faith. That's how we were made. We were designed that way. And every day, you say, what are you talking about? Every day we breathe air that we cannot see. Uh, we're quick to get on airplanes and distrust that they're going to stay in the air 30,000 feet above the surface. And we just assume as we travel through our town uh, that that red light is going to prevent other cars from coming and crashing on us as we go through an intersection at a green light. We just have faith that those things are going to do their job. That's what faith is. Faith is dependence. I want to say that again. Faith is dependence. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 13. And this is what I want to understand about faith. Even though faith does mean belief, it also means conviction, trust. It means confidence. It means dependability. And again, God is the best example of faithfulness in 2 Timothy Chapter 2, verse number 13, he says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he says he cannot deny himself. Again, God is an example of faithfulness. Revelation 19, 11. I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. God is an example of faithfulness. And so since the fruit of the Spirit is about us reproducing or producing the character of God, if I want to bear fruit or if I want to produce the fruit of the Spirit, that means I am desiring to show forth the character of the God that I worship, then I've got to have faithfulness in my life. Faithfulness in my life means that I have confidence. If we have faithfulness in God, then we are confident in our walk with God. Revelations 2 and 10 says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He is saying, be confident. As I've seen how this season has affected some in their faith and their walk, I've seen some get so much more confident, some get so much more strong in their faith, but we've seen some that has fallen away from that, and, and their, 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 their faith is diminishing, and, and their confidence is diminishing, and, and they're saying things, and they're posting things, that, that, that's not showing that they have confidence in who God is or who God wants to be in their life. And I challenge you, if there is some kind of feeling inside of you that you don't feel deserving or you don't feel like you have hope or you don't feel like you're doing anything or that you're anybody, you need to filter those feelings through the Word of God and filter those feelings through the kind of faith that God wants you to have in Him because He wants us to have confidence in Him even to the point of death, he said, and if we can have confidence in him to the point of death, I will give you the crown of life, he said. We can't lose confidence in storm. We can't lose confidence in seasons like we're going through right now. We can't lose faith in seasons like we're going through right now. To bear the fruit of the Spirit, we've got to maintain our confidence in Jesus Christ and know that he is faithful. God is faithful. Faithfulness in my life means that I have confidence. It also means that I have conviction. We need conviction to be birthed again in some of our lives. Amen. Third John 3 and 4 says, It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Amen. Faithfulness in my life is not just meaning that I that I have 
conviction or confidence. Amen. Faithfulness in my life also means that I have commitment in my life. Commitment. I'm going to say that again. Commitment. First Timothy chapter number one, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful. He considered me committed. Amen. How, how much should we desire that we should be seen as someone that presents ourselves as committed to the cause of Christ, committed to the will of God, committed to the order of God, committed to be faithful to God? He says, man, I, I thank Christ Jesus that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Committed. But not only should conviction and commitment and confidence be displayed, but as we bear that part of the fruit called faithfulness, we should also have consistency. Consistency. Luke chapter 16 and verse number 10. Unless you are faithful in small matters, you won't be faithful in large ones. If you cheat even a little, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. Some can't be responsible and consistent with small things, but yet want big responsibilities and big titles. And, and I want to tell you, we've got to remember that faith or faithfulness is dependence. We've got to be consistent in the small things. And then God can bless us with greater things. In our ministries, we've got to be consistent in the small areas of ministry. And God will open doors for greater areas of ministry. Amen. And that's the foundation. That dependence upon God is the foundation of the true friendship that we are supposed to have with him as he calls us friend. I am consistent. I'm faithful. Matthew 25 and 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Uh, someone this week and made mention, made a comment. It's one that I've heard before. Uh, I'm sure you have. Uh, that you, you never know that how you are as a servant until you are treated like one. Uh, and that is so true. We've got to make sure that we produce the fruit of the Spirit as we are treated as servants, as we are asked of things, so that we can demonstrate our faithfulness to the things of God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. 1 Corinthians 4.2 now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. But I just want to say I'm faithful. He said, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I hope that it can be said of me that whatever I am faced with a situation that I won't run from it, but I can. it can be said that I will be proven faithful. I will be proven that I am a man of confidence. I am a man of conviction. I am a man of commitment. And I am a man of consistency in my walk with God. Amen. Meekness. Let's move on to the next one. Meekness. Meekness means mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, or humility. Gentleness and humility. Meekness. Matthew 18 and 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In chapter 23 of Matthew, verse 11, he says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And so our meekness toward God, the fruit of the Spirit being produced, meekness toward God, 
is that part of us that in our innermost beings, as God brings thing in, things into our life, brings situations into our life, that we accept them as good, all of them, in all things give thanks. All things that come our way. Accept those things that God has put toward us and in our lives without disputing it and without resisting it. It's a meekness. It's the opposite of self-interest. It's the opposite of self-assertiveness. It's coming from something deep inside that says, God, I'm trusting you. That whatever is in my, in my life right now, I am trusting you. If it's here, you've allowed it to be here. If it's here, God, you have allowed it to be here. And I'm going to trust in your goodness to control this situation in my life. I'm not going to take it in my own hands because I'll mess it all up. But God, I'm believing if you brought this into my situation, if you brought this into my ministry, if you brought this into my marriage, if you brought this into my life, I'm going to trust in your goodness and your control over what's been brought into my life. In other words, through everything that comes our way, I'm not making decisions based on my own self. Well, that's a mouthful right there. And I wish I could raise my hand and say, I've always done that. And I, I wish I could raise my hand and say, that's the way I'm always going to do it. But that's what I can say that I'm striving to do. And I hope that you're striving to do that. That I make decisions not based on my fleshly feelings, but I make decisions based on God's will and God's purpose and God's plan. And if God has brought something into my life, I've got to trust his control over what has been brought into my life. Somebody say amen. Unfortunately, though, the word meekness rhymes with the word weakness. Meekness, weakness. Meekness, weakness. And the unfortunate part about that is, is that so many times people put those together as synonyms that mean the same. If you're meek, you're weak. But ironically, meekness is far from being weak. Producing meekness is far from that. Because in order to produce and to bear meekness in our life, that takes a lot of strength. It takes a strong person. Meekness is the power of your potential. Your potential under God's control. Meekness is the power of your potential under God's control. What are you saying? I'm saying that we cannot fulfill our full potential in the kingdom if God is not controlling our life. If it's self-promotion, if it's self-will, if that's what's driving up at us, if it's ambition that's driving us, we're not going to reach our full potential. We may accomplish great things in our life. We may accomplish great things in our ministries. But if we are not controlled by the things of God, the order of God, the will of God, then we will never reach the power of our full potential. That's why it's so important. We can't separate any of this fruit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the faith, the meekness, and then let's talk about the last portion of this, temperance. Temperance means self-control. Kind of leads into that, doesn't it? And I don't believe it's any accident that love is the first portion of the fruit and that temperance is the last portion of the fruit. Because all of the things that we've talked about, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the faith, the meekness, the temperance. It all begins in love and ultimately ends in result in self-control. 
Billy Graham points out, he says, there are men who can command armies but cannot command themselves. There are men who by their burning words can sway vast multitudes but who cannot keep silence under the provocation of Rome. The highest mark of nobility is self-control. It is more kingly than regal crown and purple robe. That's why it can be said that a lot of people have a lot of self-control in one area, but falling apart in other areas. Only the Holy Ghost can help us in all areas. Because you know on that job application or that monthly review or that quarterly review or that annual review you do at your job and they they want you to list your strengths and your weaknesses it's so easy to list our strengths we can think about those and it's not that we can't think about our weaknesses it's just that they're harder to write down they're harder to say but whenever we are producing the fruit of the spirit we recognize our strengths and our weaknesses. And we recognize that anything good in us comes from him. And we recognize that it's in my weakness that his strength is made perfect. So actually, my fleshly strengths are nothing in comparison with the weakness that I have in my life. Because that is where the power and the strength of God is made perfect. But if we're insecure, we won't display temperance. Only the Holy Ghost can help us. Only the Holy Ghost can help us voluntarily abstain from things that would cause us to sin. Abstain from things that would cause us to not be what God wants us to be. Self-control. We've got to exhibit self-control or temperance as we're studying. That word is a combination of two words. E-N and then karatos. K-R-A-T-O-S. N means in, just like it sounds. And karatos means strength or power or might or dominion. And so that strength or that power, that karatos, has been passed in this English language that we have in words like democratic or the, the rule of the people or by the people. And they're theocratic or the rule by God or autocratic. Or that means rule by self. A person with and kratos, and person with that strength is ruled from within. Temperance. Not our power, but God's power. I'm not ruled by power within me, but by God's power. Proverbs 25, 28. A person without self-control is as defenseless as a city with broken down walls. Self-control. Anything that's not controlled in our lives. Listen, anything that we don't have control over in our lives will harm our relationships. What kind of things, Pastor? Uncontrolled anger. Ephesians 4, 26. And don't sin by letting anger gain control over you. He said, be angry, sin not. He goes on in verse 26. He says, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a mighty foothold to the devil. We can't let uncontrolled anger remain in our life or it will harm our relationships. If we let uncontrolled lust come into our life. Proverbs 6 and 26. A woman who sells her love can be bought for as little as the price of a meal. But making love to another man's wife will cost you everything. Don't let uncontrolled lust get into your life. Use self-control. Uncontrolled spending. Oh, man, Pastor, you could have stayed off of that. Proverbs 21 and 20. The wise hath wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Now, I'll be the first to admit, uh, I like stuff too. I like uh, having a good ride. I like having quote-unquote toys. As a matter of fact, there's something right now that, that I want really bad, uh, and technically I could afford it, but in good communication with my wife, hello, uh, I understand in order for me to get this other thing that I want, I've got to sell something that I've got uh, because I want to be responsible. And sometimes it takes somebody that you can talk to, that you can trust to help you be responsible and help you control some of those things. And so uh, that's why it's important uh, that we 
balance each other in our relationships, husbands and wives. Amen. Uh, I'm going to get off of that because, you know, that's, that's what that we struggle on. That's, say, Pastor, you didn't have to talk about all that uncontrolled spending. But we've got to control it because uncontrolled spending can harm relationships. Um, what, a, what a marriage is fight on? Money, religion, money. Uh, we need to make sure we're being responsible. But we also need to make sure that we don't let uncontrolled ambition come into our life. 1 Timothy 6 and 9. People who want to be rich fall into all sorts of temptations and traps. They are caught by foolish and harmful desires that drag them down and destroy them. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful. But we need to make sure that we are not led by our ambitions, our fleshly ambitions. Uh, we need to make sure that we are led by the Holy Ghost. And we need to make sure that we don't have uncontrolled ambition in our life because it will cause us to, to live lifestyles. It will cause us to take positions on our jobs. It will cause us to stay away from sometimes the calling that God has called us to because our personal ambition is controlling us more than the voice of God is leading us. Uh, and I can testify to some of that in my life. We've got to make sure that we are not being controlled by personal ambition we've got to be controlled by the spirit of god because there uh, there's there's too many people that are called that are trying that god's trying to sin that god's trying to do a work in but they're so mixed up and they're, they got their own ambitions and god's trying to work on them and they're miserable but they're just got their own personal ambition that, that's not controlled and, and it's, they're missing the will of God. We've got to be careful that we don't miss the will of God because of uncontrolled ambition. We also don't need uncontrolled tongues. James 3 and verse number 5. So also, the tongue is a small thing. But what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction. For it is set on fire by hell itself. If we don't learn self-control, self-control, we will be drawn away. We will be enticed. We will be led away from the things of God. We've got to learn temperance. James 1 verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Listen to this. That endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted, listen, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then he tells us when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. He said, do not err, my beloved brethren. If we cannot learn to discipline ourselves, if we cannot learn to discipline our walk with God and do what we're supposed to do and refrain from doing not doing what we're not supposed to do, then we'll never experience true discipleship. And I'm getting ready to close for tonight. Self-control is the line that's running in the center of the highway. It's balanced between two extremes. I've got to say no to the things that God forbids. And I've got to say yes to the things that God commands. I've got to say no to everything that's a hindrance. I've got to say no to everything that's a hindrance, even whenever it's not forbidden. If it's a hindrance to my life, if it's a hindrance to the will of God happening in my life. But then I must say yes to everything that is a blessing, even when it's not commanded. Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. The grace of God. A lot of talk about grace. He said, the grace of God that brings salvation, grace brings salvation, amen, has appeared to all men. Salvation's available to everybody. And this is what he says about grace. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And then he says, the grace of God teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The grace of God is not there so we can sin and live any life that we want to live. That's not its purpose. The grace of God teaches us that we can 
say no to ungodliness, and it teaches us that we can live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And that wording that's used there, that doesn't, that's not limited to 2,000 years ago. It's not limited to 100 years ago. It's this present age. God's Spirit helps us to say, no, I won't do that, or yes, I will do that. I'm going to be self-controlled. John 15 and verse 4, again, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same, same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, verse 7 says, and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. What a promise. Amen. And he said, herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Amen. I pray. Let's pray right now. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to bear and produce the fruit of the Spirit in our life. God, help us, Lord, to produce love. Help us to produce joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance god help us to produce the fruit of the spirit in our life so that our heavenly father can be glorified not just in heaven but in earth god i pray these things in jesus name for everyone that's listening god for everyone lord that may be struggling god help them not fulfill the works of the flesh but lord help them produce fruit of the spirit in their life so they may be pleasing and glorifying you in jesus name amen god bless you thank you for tuning in to our midweek bible study here at boonville first united pentecostal church don't forget this sunday we're beginning phase one of coming back into the sanctuary nine o'clock a.m for all of our seniors and those that are increased risk 11 o'clock a.m for everyone and we will be broadcasting our 11 o'clock service at 6 o'clock p.m. Sunday night. For those who are unable to come to the sanctuary, I pray you have a blessed rest of the week. And I can't wait to see each of you come in Sunday in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.